Hello everyone, this is Philip Shields. Welcome to Light on the Rock and thank all of you from all over the world who come to our website. By now, if you've been listening to us for long, you know that we keep God's holy days. We keep the weekly Sabbath on the seventh day. We also keep the holy days that God has prescribed, including the Feast of Tabernacles and Passover in the spring and so on, but Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. We do that because that's what Yeshua did. That's what God did. He rested on the seventh day when he created it back in Genesis 2. And that's what the early believers did. And by now you also know, therefore, that I don't, and those who come to this website primarily, we don't keep the world's religious holidays like Easter and Halloween and, of course, even Christmas. Christmas is purportedly the birth of Jesus Christ, and yet it's rooted, the whole season is rooted in pagan traditions. Now don't get me wrong, don't misunderstand. I love my Savior. That's what this whole website's about, is forming a relationship with God our Father, Abba, my, our dear Daddy, and a relationship with one another, loving God and loving one another. That's what this whole site's about. I love the fact that he came and was born of a Virgin Mary here in Bethlehem on this earth, far from heaven, and grew up as a perfectly healthy and righteous man, died for all of us. I love all that. I love the story of his birth, but it had nothing to do with Christmas, Christ's Mass. So today I'm going to assume that many of you know that, and um, you found out that Christ was not born December 25 at all, in fact, and in fact, the Catholic Church didn't announce it as the birth date of Yeshua, of Jesus Christ, until 340 AD, Pope Julius I. And so they found that the Catholic Church found that it was a lot easier to bring people into the fold of their church if they would let them keep their pagan customs and traditions and just put a new label on them. They found this much, much easier. So again, don't misunderstand me here. I, I love... Uh, the birth of my Savior. But I have two questions today. I'm going to talk about two topics today. The first one simply is this. Is it okay? Is it okay to dabble in Christmas and Easter and Halloween and all these other things that the world keeps? Is it okay to dabble in that if you put a Christian label on it? Is it okay um, as long as you're not worshiping Saturn, the Saturnalia, and you're not worshiping Odin and the pagan gods and goddesses associated with the pagan traditions of Christmas. You know, last time I, I challenged you all in, a, in, in my last blog, I mean, I said I'd like to, instead of me writing down the whole history of everything, you go look, you go look it up. You get on Google, you get on Bing, and you write in uh, something like uh, customs or origins of Christmas traditions origins of Christmas traditions, or you might even write in pagan origins of Christmas traditions. See what you come up with, and you'll see why I have to say that it is rooted in paganism. In fact, I got a, um, I, I took a picture of a, uh, somebody's car bumper sticker, and it says, Merry Christmas, keep Christ in Christmas. The problem is, Christ never was in Christmas, as I'll show you. He never was. Is there anything wrong then? Is there anything wrong then with enjoying the family get togethers, enjoying the gift wrapping, the singing of the admittedly beautiful tunes of Christmas songs, putting up and enjoying the Christmas lights people put around their homes? Is there anything wrong with that? Especially if you're dedicating in your home, in your life, the whole season to Christ. You see, a lot of believers think there's nothing wrong if they do that. So we'll talk about that in detail. The second thing I hope to co uh, cover, as much as I have time left for, I have to keep these down to about 40 minutes if I can, what is the true story? The second thing now is what is the true story behind Christ's birth? So much of what we're even being told about his birth from Matthew and Luke, the other two Gospels, uh, Mark and John, don't even talk about his birth at all. Not at all. So... We're going to talk about the true story. Now, remember the forbidden tree, the forbidden fruit of the tree in the Garden of Eden. God had put two trees in the garden. And 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't all evil. It was a beautiful tree. Genesis 3 says that Eve saw there was a beautiful tree, beautiful fruit, beautiful food. And um, so what you've heard about Christmas and the birth of Christ, a lot of it is beautiful. A lot of it is lies. And, I, and the, whole, the whole season is rooted in paganism on top of that. So let's start with that first point then that I was going to talk about. The first one, is it okay to dabble? And the second one is, what is the true story? Let's go back to the first one. Is it okay to dabble if we're doing it in Christ's name and we're not having anything to do with the pagan gods and all of that? Does that make it okay for us to give gifts to our children, to have a little Christmas tree, and not to overdo the, the commercialism of it? But we're going to keep it to Christ, we, think, we say, okay? And so, but we'll find that uh, so much of what we have been told is so untrue. Back to the tree again for a second. Remember, the fruit of the tree was entirely forbidden. God the Father and, and, and Yeshua, uh, the one, uh, the Word of God, they didn't say to Adam and Eve, God did not say to Adam and Eve that it's okay if you have just a bite or two once a week or so. You can dabble with this tree once in a while. No, God says you must not eat of it. Not one bite. You're either with me all the way or you're not, is what God said to Adam and Eve. Christmas goes back to Saturnalia festivities of the ancient Rome and other cities. Saturnalia was dedicated to Saturn, the pagan god Saturn, and they celebrated the, the sun as well. Uh, the pagan, uh, the celebration of, of the sun, because December 21 is the shortest day of the year. And then by 22, 23, 24, 25 of December, we're seeing that the sun is winning again. And the pagans have made a big celebration. They called it the Saturnalia. And they would have these big orgies of sexual orgies, drunken orgies, and anything goes. Even the servants were kings for a while. And it, 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 was, it was just a wild time in Rome. So they celebrated the winter solstice with fornication, adultery, drunkenness. If we can get a picture to depict it that's not too sexual and sensual, we'll try to do that. But it's really not a moral time at all. Some of our Christmas parties today can get that way. So what people try to do today, who do understand the pagan roots of it all, is they'll say, okay, it's okay to keep Christmas now because we're no longer worshiping the sun. That never comes up into it at all. Uh, we're, we're, we're not worshiping the longer days. Uh, we're, 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 we're remembering Christ in all of this. So they go ahead with their little Christmas tree. So that's my question. If you worship God, can you still be involved in pagan-rooted festivities in a religious uh, festival? Now, see, by the way, Thanksgiving is not a religious festival, and it was not, here in America at least, was not, as far as I can see, rooted in paganism. But can we be involved in pagan-rooted religious activities and holidays? I say no, 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 and I'm going to show you that to you. God, God wants us to, to be either hot or cold, and he spits out what's lukewarm. Remember what he said to the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3. He says, I would be, I, I would that you would be either hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. And I'll spit you out, I'll vomit, I'll spew you out of my mouth. He says, either be in or get, or get out totally of Babylon. You can't have one foot in Babylon and one foot in God's way. You can't mix that. You can't be worshiping God and demons, Paul says. And I think it's in 2 Corinthians. There's no in-between with God. In, Rome, in Revelation 18.4, Revelation 18.4, he says to his people, Come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon, my people, that you not participate in the plagues I'm going to send upon her. Come out of her. So let's go back now to Exodus 32. I, I wish you would turn with me in your Bibles in Exodus 32. Uh, back in the days of Moses and Aaron, the people back then thought, you know what, Moses is up there in Mount Sinai. He'd been up there for around 40 days. And they started wondering, is he going to come back? Has he been burned up in the fire? It does seem to me that Moses went right up into the fire where God, where God is, because it says the whole top was just bursting in flames. And God told Moses, come up here, be with me. And so in those 40 days, God was explaining everything about the tabernacle and, and the, the, the rules and things that he wanted. 
And so um, while he was gone, let's read it. Exodus 32 verses 1 to 4 for now. And when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, Exodus 32 verse 1, the people gathered together to Aaron, that's uh, Moses' brother, who became the high priest. And they said to him, Come, make us gods that we shall go, that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, we don't know what's happened to him. We need someone else. The man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. Verse 2, And Aaron said to them, Break off the gold earrings on your ears. Bring me a bunch of gold, he's saying. Verse 3, All the people did that. Verse 4, He received the gold from their hand. And he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. And I will submit to you, I bet it was a beautifully done molded calf. I bet it looked beautiful. And then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. That was not Aaron saying that. That was the people saying that. Aaron by now is getting a little nervous. Where is this going to go? How far is this going to go? Can't let this thing get out of hand. So notice very carefully. Very carefully. Now, remember, I've already told you about the Garden of Eden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You couldn't just take a little piece of it here and there and mostly leave it alone. No, no. You had to totally leave it alone or get out. And the same thing here. Now, Aaron thinks he can dabble a little bit, you see. Exodus 32, verse 5 now. I hope you've seen this before. It's a very, very strikingly important verse. So when Aaron saw it, the gold calf, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. L-O-R-D, all caps. To Yehovah. I know you're looking at a gold calf, he says, but we're going to do it to Yehovah. Yeah, the gold calf will still be here, but we all know he's, that that gold calf represents Yehovah. So it's going to be okay. I mean, that's what he's implying here. We're going to have a feast to Yehovah, like the holy days. And let's keep this verse up there for a second. Can you believe what Aaron said? He said the gold calf is to be a feast to Yehovah, to the true God. I'll allow you to have some of your pagan traditions, as long as you include some worship to the true God, he's basically saying. As you revel in your orgies, your immoralities, and your drunken parties, the Bible says, and they went up and we went up to play. That's just a euphemism for they were having a sexual orgy galore going on, getting drunk and all of that. And that's what Aaron said is, hey, we're going to worship Jehovah with it. Now look at verse 6. Then they rose up early on the next day, offered burnt offerings. They went to church first. They went to church first, like people going to Christmas Mass early in the morning, then they, then they can have their party and all that. They went to church first. They offered burnt offerings. They brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So they pretended. They pretended. They weren't being pagan about it. They were openly worshiping the true God, they said. They even burnt, burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And Aaron had said, this is to Yehovah, to the Lord. They went to church. But what does God do? How does God react to this? God is furious. Let's keep reading. He's furious. Now, if you had told people, look, I don't want you getting involved in pagan things in the lands where you're going to be going. They have a lot of pagan worship to pagan gods. I don't want you learning about me from their gods. Don't have anything to do with it. Or if you were a grandfather or grandmother and you had all your grandkids and great grandkids in front of you and you said, you know, all these terrible, terrible orgy, orgy type parties and partying and holidays that the people in the city do. I want your kids having nothing to do with that. We don't do that. But then you find out not only do they start doing it, but they get the townspeople to put your name on those festivities that you said you hated. How do you think you would feel? Exodus 32, verse 7. And Yehovah said to Moses, Go, get down your people whom you brought up. I think this is, 
I find this a little humorous that when Moses is upset with the Israelites, he says, God, you brought all these people out, your people, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, when God says, when God's upset with the people, he says to Moses, these people you brought up, <laughs> so have corrupted themselves. The end of verse 7, verse 8 now, Exodus 32, verse 8. They turn aside very quickly out of the way, which I commanded them. It wasn't that long before now, before this, that God was, they were hearing God's voice. The Mount Sinai was ablaze. They heard the Ten Commandments and the mountain shaking. That was just days before this. And they made themselves a molded calf. They worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. God is not only furious, he's hurt, he's offended. And Yehovah said to Moses, I've seen these people, indeed it's a stiff-necked people. Now go, go, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them. Do you think he liked them proclaiming that that was made to him now? Do you think God likes us proclaiming that we're going to keep a pagan holiday like Christmas, but now worship Jesus in it? When he wasn't even born anytime, anywhere near December 25? Brethren, we have to quit dabbling. Maybe other ministers aren't saying it this powerfully or directly to you. They don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to hurt your feelings either. But you've got to quit dabbling in the pagan religions and ways of this world. You and I have to come out of the world. Me, all of us, we're, we're all, we all dabble in our own ways, in different ways. We've got to come to see it and repent, come out of it. The living God here is furious. So no, you can't claim it's all for good. You're helping the poor families at Christmas time. You're singing carols to God. My brothers and sisters in Christ, no, no, no. You can't mix and match paganism with the worship of God. You, we, we can't. We have to come out of her, my people, lest I make you go through the same plagues I'm going to pour out on modern-day Babylon just before Christ returns, he says. That's Revelation 18.4. Maybe we can put it on the, on the board here. Uh, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her plagues. When Moses finally saw for himself what was upsetting God so much, you know what he did? He was so angry, he lifted up his, he lifted up the two tablets of the Ten Commandments and dashed them against the rocks, broke all ten. <laughs> so, even Moses. So anyway, relabeling is not going to work, folks. You're either in or you're out. And you have to remember, God wants to be worshipped. John 4, 24, let's read it. Let's start in verse 23. Here is Yeshua. I, I, I use the name Mama called him, okay? Yeshua means Savior, salvation, uh, or Yehovah saves. And so uh, the name, the sound Jesus wasn't even heard for at least two or three, four hundred years after Christ was resurrected. John 4, 23, 24. But the hour is coming. He's speaking to the Samaritan woman now. He's at a well, Jacob's well. I've drank from that well. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers that you will worship Father, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeking such to worship him, God is spirit, and those who worship him must, must worship him in spirit and truth. Must. No dabbling. And when we talk about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, I saw part of a cartoon that was just having to be playing when I I'd left it on a particular channel, I guess, and Frosty the Snowman. It was a real snowman and all this. And you mean you've been lying to the children saying it wasn't a real snowman? They had it all reversed. We're full of lies. Flying reindeer, flying Santas. Full of lies. We can't be lying to our children anymore about Santa or anything else. It's not just a harmless lie. A lie is a lie and flying reindeer, and the cookies we put out, and the lie is a lie is a lie, and God is, and God is no lie. I know. I know. You have children. You have parents. You have cousins. You have nephews. You have all your friends who are going to wonder, what on earth are you doing? What do you mean you're not going to keep Christmas? I know. It's tough. Some friends of mine had the same problem. They had to work through it with their parents. But they did. And I'll say with you and your own kids, God's way is so much better, you guys. I told my kids when they were growing up, you know what, we don't keep Christmas because God tells us not to get involved with the ways of the world, and it's just a lie. 
the whole thing is just not true. Some of it's true, but a lot of it's a lie. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, remember? And so we take them to the Feast of Tabernacles. We keep the feast, and then the eighth day, there's eight days of celebration and worship. We buy them new clothes. We buy them toys. We buy them fun stuff. We take them out. We go someplace, somewhere fun. Uh, I mean, way far away. I mean, I'm talking states away, sometimes countries away. We've been all over the world, my wife and I, and all over the, the United States at various feast sites. Our kids loved it. And do you think they would give up eight days of that and the travel and the fun for one day of Christmas? I guarantee you not. In fact, our, our young daughters, when they were young, the oldest daughter, Rachel, one time came to me at a food store. It was Safeway, I believe, back then. And she would run up ahead at the, uh, through the aisle and over to the next aisle. And I was behind her. I was maybe halfway through the aisle. And she comes back to the aisle I'm in. And the loudest voice says, Daddy, Daddy, they have all that yucky Christmas stuff in here. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's what she said. And so they understand. But if they see you compromising, that will not sit well with them, I don't think. John 12, verse 42 to 43. I know it will be hard. I know it. But if you have younger children still at home, it's not going to be as hard as you think it's going to be. But you have to ask yourself, what are you seeking here? The approval of mankind, children, relatives, father, mother, cousins, or the approval of God? In John 12, verses 42 to 43, you had someone called the ruler of a synagogue. He was the, the guy in charge. And they saw the miracles. They heard the preaching of Yeshua. And look what it says. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, in Christ, is the context here. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Which will it be for you? Praises of men or the praises of God? You want to enjoy Babylon while you can and then get hit hard by the plagues from God Almighty when he sends Jesus Christ to rule here on the earth? Or do you want to come out of Babylon? So that's the first point. We cannot dabble. The second point, even the story of Jesus' birth, I don't know how much of this I'll be able to complete today because I'm, I'm time limited, but was he really born December 25? Do your own research. Save me some time here. But even a cursory research will let you see that anybody who's really thought about it knows it can't be December 25. It was not until 340 AD that the Catholic Church announced it was um, December 25. And... Um, so when was he born? Let's go back to the Bible in Luke 2, verses 1 to 3. And keep in mind the two whole Gospels. Two whole Gospels, the Gospel of Mark and John, don't even mention his birth at all. So how important is it? They don't even mention it. Matthew and Mark do. Luke 2, it came to pass in those days the decree went out. Luke 2, verse 1. From Caesar Augustus, that all the world, all the world in the under the Roman Empire, should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was, Quirinius was uh, governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to their city. Now, no emperor in his right mind would have called for a census in December. December is known as the cold, rainy, muddy, sometimes snowy month. Uh, I think when my father was there, it was snowing on December 25th. Right now in Bethlehem, uh, between December 14 and 10, when I wrote these notes down, uh, the highs were in the low 50s Fahrenheit, and the lows were in the low 40s Fahrenheit. I'll, I'll put on, uh, in, in my notes what that is in Celsius. So it's certainly not warm. It's uh, in the teens as, as a high in Celsius. And a lot of rain a lot of times. So how important is the date, first of all? Remember again, two Gospels don't even talk about it. When, what was important is that Christ died for us. Yeshua said, I want you to remember me. Do this in remembrance of me. 
I had a whole sermon on that. Do this in remembrance of me. You might want to look that up. Remembrance of me. Just type those three words. Remembrance of me in the search bar and the Light on the Rock website at the top right corner and you'll see it. So we can get pretty close to finding out his birth because we know that John the Baptist was six months older than Yeshua. And we know that his father, and I'll put a link in there too. I'll put a link in the, the notes of someone who's done a fine job of showing the connection uh, between what I'm saying here. We know that John the Baptizer was six months. He wasn't a Baptist, like a First Baptist Church or something like that, okay? His father was of the course or grouping called Abaya, A-B-I-J-A. -A. And we know that, and we know when each course served. We know what time of year they served. Uh, King David was seeing so many priests that he divided them into 24 groupings or courses. And then each one would serve for, for um, each course would serve for about two weeks. And so the eighth of the 24 courses was what John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was a part of. And so when we know, when we go from the fact that we know he, when he was serving and then when he got home, his wife somehow got pregnant miraculously from God opened her womb and everything. And then you go nine months from that, okay, and then add another six months and you come to about the fall, uh, around, around uh, you come to mid-September, early to mid-September uh, of the seventh Hebrew month so that, that brings us to between the 1st and the 15th, between the 1st and the 15th of the, of the 7th Hebrew month, which means that very likely Yeshua was born not in the spring and not in the winter, but uh, he was born very likely around the Feast of Trumpets, um, Yom Teruah. Uh, the, the, the Jews refer to it as Rosh Hashanah. Or the Feast of Tabernacles, or, or uh, Sukkot. Sukkot, okay? It does say that he came to Tabernacle with us in John 1, I think 14, that he came in Tabernacle with us. So, so who knows if he came at the Feast of Tabernacles or came at the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, but we know it's probably somewhere in there. But here's the point. It really doesn't matter when, because Scripture is silent about it. When God wants us to worship him, and when God wants us to remember, he tells us very specifically exact starting time and ending time of each weekly Sabbath, sundown to sundown. Don't go into the sunrise to sunrise stuff. It's sundown to sundown, according to God. He always spells it out in very, very careful detail. He, we're told exactly when each holy day is, and there's no question about it. So if God wanted us to keep Christmas, not forget Christmas, if God wanted us to keep the birth of Christ, he would have told us when it happened. Now, there are other impressions we get from the stories we're told, and I'm going to try to correct these as much time as I have. Anyway, we're told that uh, we have this picture in our mind that Mary rode this donkey all the way down. There's no statement of that. And that, is, that she got there, the story I've been told is uh, over the years is, is, oh, she's having a baby practically. There's no room in the inn, so they put her in this manger. She has the baby, bang, right there. Look, look, at, uh, look at Luke. <laughs> Luke 2, verses 4 to 6. Luke 2, verses 4 to 6. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, his betrothed wife, who was with, like his engaged wife-to-be, what we might say today, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. While they were there, if that's the correct translation, it gives me the impression saying that they were there a while, while they were there, or it could have been quickly. But anyway, I'm just saying it's not necessarily always the way you're, you're told. Keep in mind she's betrothed. Remember that when Joseph and Mary went into Bethlehem, okay, someone betrothed back then, 
that's more than what we would call being engaged, but not quite as much as being married. It still took a divorce to break your betrothal. I don't know if you know that or not. You still had to get a divorce, so it was pretty serious. But Mary and Joseph had not had any sexual relations yet. They were engaged. It would take a, a, a divorce to stop it. But the angel who appeared to Mary came when she was betrothed. And Mary said she had not known any man yet at that point. So they had no sex yet. Mary was his betrothed. The NIV says in Luke 2 verse 5, uh, uh, Mary who was pledged to be married to him. The Holman translation says who was engaged to him. So Mary remained a virgin until she gave birth to Messiah. I'll prove that here in Matthew 1, verses 24 and 25. Matthew 1, verses 24 and 25, we'll put it up. And then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus, or if this was in Hebrew, it would be Yeshua. He did not know her, meaning they did not have any sex. Let's just be real clear so we have no question about what it's saying here. Know this too, that as much as I respect Mary, Mary too was a sinner. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we're told in Romans 3.23. All! She did not go to heaven. She, did not, she was not assumed up into heaven. Nothing in Scripture says that. Uh, she is not a mediator between us and, 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 our, and God. She was not perfect. She needed a Savior just like you and I do. No place in the inn. I'll just briefly I'll look at the notes on this because the word inn can also mean guest room. Uh, it does not mean Motel 6 or uh, Holiday Inn. It, you know, it, it, it could mean a room. For example, where, when Jesus said, go and ask the master if he has the room ready for us to keep the Passover in the upper room. And so um, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, the same word that's used there. That's in Luke 22, 11. Luke 22, 11. Let's go back to Luke 2, verse 7, because there's so much there. Luke 2, verse 7. If you pop it up on the screen, maybe. Uh, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Um, did you know that Mary, after this, had at least six other children. Matthew 13, verses 55 and 56, we'll put it on the screen. Um, Yeshua had just preached in Nazareth. Some were offended. How can this guy be anybody? We know who he is. You know, it's hard for a prophet to have any glory in his own hometown. And Matthew 13, 55 to 56, is this not, it's not this the carpenter's son and is not his mother called Mary. And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Sisters means at least two, right? So he had at least two sisters, maybe three or four, who knows? And where did this man get all this, all this, all this knowledge? He had all these things. Now the James that's mentioned in Matthew 13, uh, verse 55, is the James who became the leader of the Jerusalem church. The apostle James was beheaded early in the, early in the course of time. And the, but this brother of Jesus Christ, half-brother, uh, became the leader of the Jerusalem church and wrote the book of James at the end of the New Testament. Judas here is the, is the man we now know as Jude, who wrote the book of Jude at near the end of the New Testament. Um, you find the same thing. By the way, um, he's called the carpenter's son. He himself was also called a carpenter. Mark 6, verse 3 is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? And then they list him again. Mark 6, verse 3, is not this the carpenter? So he not only was a carpenter's son, but he also was a carpenter. So he was laid in a manger. Now, a manger is not a stable. A manger is a feeding trough for, where there is food. Obviously, they're not in a house. Uh, Yeshua is the bread of life. He's right around, he's being around food, even right here, you see. And uh, God revealed all this to the shepherds. And uh, boy, there's so much more i got to do. I'm running out of time, though. Um, the shepherds were not out in the field by night in December. Trust me on that. It was too cold. They were not out there. 
The story about the shepherds is uh, is fine as as told, but when we see these birth of Jesus depictions that show some shepherds, some sheep, maybe a cow or or horse or donkey, and three kings, that part is not true. Not true. I, I think I'll leave the full story in my notes. Uh, there were no kings or even magi in the manger scene. None. After Yeshua is born, eight days later, on the eighth day, he is circumcised. Where do the, where do the magi come in? Okay, let's read when they come in. Matthew 2, verse 11. Matthew 2, verse 11. And when they, the magi, the wise men, had come into the house, not in a manger anymore, they saw the young child, no longer, he's a toddler now, no longer a baby, no longer a baby lying there in a manger, all wrapped up in all that. They saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. If Yeshua was just a good man, that would have been a terrible sin to have let anybody worship him. Because we are to worship only God. They came to worship him. They were allowed to worship him. And there were many times later that as an adult, Yeshua let people worship him. So in this scene, Joseph is not present, but he comes back later and then they get, he gets the vision. You got to flee. You got to get out of here. They want to kill him. And so they ran off to Egypt. I'm going to have to skip tons of stuff here. But I just want to end by saying this. The true story is that Yeshua was not just a prophet. He was not just a normal, regular guy. He came from God. His father was literally God the Father. He not only was a good man, but he humbled himself. Go back and read. I'll put it on the board here. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. And just keep it up there for a while while I speak. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11 from the Holman Bible. Make your attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of a man, of men. And when he had come as a man in external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to, even to death, to, even to the death on a cross. And so therefore God has exalted him above all names and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth and every tongue will confess that this Jesus Christ, this Yeshua, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Someday I'll do a whole, new, a whole sermon on who is this Jesus, who is this Yeshua, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, sitting at the right hand of God Almighty, the Father. And though he's coming as judge and ruler and king, he also wants to be not just your savior, he also wants to be your friend. And he is. And he's also our advocate. So Revelation 18.4, let's put that up there again. Revelation 18.4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her. Come out of Babylon. It's the context. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. So no, we can't, we just cannot be dabbling in Christmas anymore. If you're finding it too hard to do it right now, this year, I hope next year, by next year, you'll decide I'm going to be all in for God and all out to Babylon. I'm going to give my kids gifts at the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm going to introduce my kids and grandkids to the Feast of Tabernacles, like you should be doing. But we're not dabbling in Christmas, not one bit. If we do dabble, that's not an example of God's people coming out of Babylon. You're partly in, partly out. You're going to be in trouble for that. We instead worship our great king in spirit and in truth. No more lies about Santa, flying reindeer, that Christ was born December 25, that there were three kings in the manger. They weren't. We all have to be all in. So we praise you, our king and our savior. We praise you. Hallelujah, we're so glad that he came. 
to earth to live and die for us. And we praise you, Father in heaven, for that. And uh, we're not of this world. And we're not involved in Christmas trees and Merry Christmas and caroling and all that kind of stuff. We're not. So come, Yeshua. Come, Father. Send him soon. The world needs him. So until next time, this is Philip Shields. And I'm not going to wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> That's for sure. Philip Shields, your brother and your friend in Christ. Thanks for watching. Tell your friends about us. Please feel free to make comments. Feel, please feel free to uh, contact us. And God bless you all and have peace and joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord.